Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whenever. Welcome back to another video of mine and uh, this one's special in the sense that I have been thinking of some time, for some time, of doing something interesting and unusual for Christmas. Uh, out of the ordinary from the, the normal educational videos I do and this time what I'd like to try to do from now until the Christmas season fully gets under the underway in that last week before the big day I thought I'd have a go at reading in serialized form the complete novella by Charles Dickens called A Christmas Carol hopefully uh, also trying to do the voices and <laughs> It'll be fun to see if I can actually do that. Uh, I'm doing this largely because I wanted to do something more fun than simply the kind of heavy duty stuff I do for my students and also to uh, have a go at trying to um, do something more artistic and creative and maybe introduce something like a dramatic series in the same vein that Charles Dickens would have known such as I know when he was uh, promoting his books one of the things he used to do was to go on tour, tours reading from his uh, his writing uh, to big crowds of people in theatres all over the country and one of the reasons he did that was not just as a part of the advertising process to sell a few more copies but also because he was really quite good at reading and in the process of doing that he had a chance to be the, the dramatist personae of his own small plays as you might have as you might have said and I think that's quite a good idea to revive so I'm going to have a shot at it too not my original not write anything that I've written originally but uh, having a go at a popular piece of seasonal writing which might be fun to do now now that halloween is out of out, out the way this is the i'm speaking on the first of november in the year 2020. this initial video then is an introduction to the series uh, i think probably i'll manage to get five or six individual episodes of the book uh, done between now and christmas i want to promote them every week uh, not only to people who are my students but also through other channels such as on Facebook and on YouTube uh, so hopefully you, if you're listening to this you not only know that I can talk the hind legs of a donkey as my granny would have said but also get to know me a little bit better as time goes on yes you guessed it for those who've never met me before I'm a transgender person so this is a transgender person's take on one of the great Christian and Christmas and secular and quite unusual stories of the festive season. I think it's also quite important to do this now that we're in the depths of a pandemic where people are feeling very much on their own and it would be nice to have someone, I suppose, even me, read you a story in weekly parts uh, when you're feeling a little bit deserted and alone and especially a story like this one which has got I think a great degree of passion and human hope written all over it it's a perennial favorite of mine I read A Christmas Carol if I can in full to myself in bed normally uh, when I, before I go to sleep at night I try to have a read through of it before Christmas comes along it's part of the sort of routine I have every year I never get sick of it and in some respects every time I read it I gain a slightly deeper insight into the one I had previously so this is in some respects a product of all of that if you enjoy it please do visit my Patreon and Thank you, phone. Please do join. Visit my Patreon, which is at the very end of the video, 
and subscribe or tip me something via PayPal because then it will help me to do things like sustain my video link and you know keep my laptop running and all the rest of and pay the rent pay the rent it's good paying the rent is good at this particular point in time and I'll also say thank you to me for doing all this all this work I am recording this on a laptop it's a MacBook Pro from about 10 years ago uh, I have pointing at me a, a, a standard uh, simple webcam um, I am improving the technology all the time uh, every time I do so it gets a little bit better having said that uh, it, it is not meant to be this is not meant to be an all singing all dancing professional video this is meant to be home entertainment in the sense of home generated at home it, me sitting around my laptop <laughs> a bit like the way people used to sit around their their fires in the distant past their coal fires their wood fires and so on and uh, if it sounds domestic great because that's what it's meant to be it's meant to be a a domestic experience. It's meant, it's meant to be something intimate rather than distant. So that's the sort of housekeeping out of the way. What I want to do also is to talk to you about the whole business of the background to the book. Charles Dickens wrote this in 1843. Uh, he's not the first one to have written a story which is related to the Christmas experience. There are others, people like Washington Irving for instance have done similar sorts of work to this before. But what's particularly clear about Charles Dickens's effort is that it became, <laughs> you can't say how important, it's, it's almost impossible to overstate the importance of Dickens's work in some of the secular traditions that we've inherited as part of the Christmas experience. One of the things I need to also say to you is that Christmas as a, as a festival, both from the religious and, and social sense of the word, uh, it was not really popular until the 19th century. Sounds weird to say that when you consider what the big kerfuffle we make about Christmas every year these days and complain about how secular and, and commercialized it is. But in fact, Christmas up until the, until the Victorians really wasn't popular at all with anyone. It had, during the, during the uh, uh, medieval period, it had been an important Christian festival in the same sense that Easter has Easter was and the Ascension was and other other Christian festivals of the same type, um, but in some ways, other festivals such as St Stephen's Day were even more celebrated than uh, uh, than uh, than Christmas was because of the nature of, of the church at that time. Christmas was on a par with other festivals, but it wasn't of the same. Uh, level of uh, huge popularity that it is these days. It was celebrated also as a, a kind of adaption of pre-Christian pagan events. A lot of people, will, whenever I mention that, will immediately say, oh, it's the Roman Saturnalia. But in fact, even before the Romans, there had been pagan events celebrating midwinter in, in the UK, this country where I am and in others around the world, which have a lot in common with the kind of events that we have with Christmas. It was a time of feasting, a time also of ceremony, and ceremony uh, in the depths of winter as a means of summoning back the sun to uh, back into life, I suppose, uh, so that you know you would get through the winter and get back to the business of being able to live a life where there at least was more food around and the game wasn't hard, as hard to find as it would be during the depths of December. Christmas at the, in that time is part and parcel of, of human life. It was a celebration in, in December all about that business of survival and the need to take part in a, in a cultural tradition which, it, which was very much to do with the animism of early, early spiritual beliefs. Over the years, other other societies overtook it and revamped it, wallpapered it, you know, gave it, gave it the old MDF treatment, covered it in plastic, <laughs> stripped it down to the wood, <laughs> stained it and distressed it, and at the end converted it into, into, into other things. So, the, you know, the, the Romans did take it on board, they, uh, they also used it as a Christmas as itself, but this middle middle win mid winter festival as a means of 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 uh, 
of um, uh, creating a, a, a good knees up for the depths of winter. And uh, it's not surprising that when, when Christianity was exported throughout the rest of Europe and, and further afield, uh, the Christian, Christianity over, you know, took over the existing festivals that already existed and Christianized them. One of the things that people often forget about, about, about all Christian festivals in the early middle medieval period is they were part pagan. Churches and the church as a whole, the Roman Catholic Church as a whole across Europe, in the pre pre Reformation period, was very much uh, um, dispersed through its own, you know, lack of efficiency in communication. Local monasteries and local uh, priesthoods and friars and people of that sort um, didn't have the communications that we have in the nineteenth, eighteenth centuries, and so on. So they largely were at their own, uh, you know. Uh, uh, own uh, allowed to be on their own and organize things in their own good way. So people tended to adapt to, to local festivities and include them within Christian uh, services and, and events. Uh, there is a, for, I'll give you an example, there is a tradition in uh, in medieval Christianity called farsing, spelled F-A-R-S-I-N-G. Farsing uh, is a word to farce, the verb to farce means the same as to stuff, uh, for instance, in the way of kind of stuffing the turkey, you know, to push <laughs> strange objects into the turkeys where its, where its innards should have been. Uh, farcing is a process that was used very often in Christian ceremonies in the medieval period as a means of filling out the service. Instead of just having hymns sung and, you know, the Latin service itself, what would happen is the local people would be involved in putting on songs and dances that were interspersed between the other aspects of, of the of, of the ceremony. Uh, this is this farcing out the, the ceremony itself. And this farcing included dances which were purely secular in origin. Uh, one of the kind of dance that was most popular during that particular period was called a carol. Uh, uh, a carol in those days was not as we know it now, a song sung at Christmas. A carol was a dance that you could do at any time of year. Uh, we still have a legacy word called, a legacy verb, to carol. Uh, and you can say to somebody who is jumping around in a circle and having a really good time that this person was caroling. Uh, caroling being a word which indicates that you, the original term that, that that was used for this particular, what we now know as a song, which was the whole business of a dance. As time went on, the tunes that went with these dances became more Christianized, and in the process of doing that, became associated only with Christmas itself, rather than with Easter or the other uh, uh, festivities of the year. And so the word carol, instead of just referring to any old folk dance, especially round folk, folk dances in the round, Came associated with with the Christmas 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 period, so we get the Christmas Carol idea from, and in some respects that's why Charles Dickens calls this novella of his from 1843 a Christmas Carol. It's a Christmas Carol because in some respects it is a the dance of time, the dance of spirits, the dance of events and festivities at that time of year. It is a circular visitation, as you might say, from spirits from beyond the grave and from beyond time and space to bring their blessings, if that's the right word, because it's quite a controversial story as this one, to a certain individual, a person called Ebenezer Scrooge. The word carol in this sense of the word doesn't refer to a song, it refers to a particular kind of dancing in the medieval sense of the word. The word carol also, I suppose, in some respects, pins this particular story firmly to Christmas. And it has to be said, uh, you know, after the medieval period, during the Refor Reformation, Christmas as a, as, a, as, a, as a ceremony, as a joyful time of the year, and especially about indulgence, which had been the, the, pre you know, the, the medieval and pre-Christian view of, of December's festiv festivities became frowned upon uh, Puritanism, especially in the in the period of the Civil War in the, in, in, in England and beyond, um, tore the heart out of Christmas, made it almost illegal, and in the process of, well, it was illegal at one time in the UK. And people 
largely didn't forget about it. They just pushed it, pushed it to one side. So for a very long time in the 18th century, for instance, right up until in the 19th century when the furore for Christmas started up again, Christmas was something which kind of like passed, not quite like any other day, but certainly not with the same kind of a gay abandon that you get today. So Christmas developed, and one of the forces that made Christmas what it is, and made Christmas as it is today, was the, the Victorian interest in the whole process of Christianity, and the Victorian need to make something out of what had been a very dull time of year. Um, you know, I mean, most of us know that the, the period from uh, kind of November right the way through to February is pretty dull. Short days, long nights, nothing much happening, cold outside, occasional snow, winds, winds light to variable. <laughs> and all the rest of it, and uh, in order to enliven that whole process, there was a kind of need for a, for, a, for a festival of some sorts. What is more interesting also is the need for festival. Festivality was, e was eminently attractive to Victorian capitalism as industrialization took off. The idea of being able to sell people things with regard to Christianity became more and more and more and more popular. So yeah, Christmas provided a really good captive audience for the promotion of all sorts of ideas that later on became seen as traditions, such as the sending of Christmas cards, which was only really evolved during the Victorian period, such as bringing Christmas trees into the house, which began when Queen Victoria and Albert used what had been previously been a pagan Scandinavian tradition and brought it no, a, a spruce tree into the house such as the business of eating turkey, which had never been part of the tradition at all. Turkey had not been seen as a really Christmas dish in one way or another, but became so largely after, after stories like A Christmas Carol, such as the business of buying Christmas gifts and s for people, uh, which, has, which was later on was what you, might, what you might call retconned, into the business of the giving of gifts to the to the child Jesus in the in the in the manger, by the three wise men, uh, you know, uh, gold, frankincense, and and myrrh, and that kind of that <laughs> that process was a kind of a, a, a readaption of a Victorian habit of giving gifts at Christmas into the Christmas story, and uh, and that process I think is really interesting because it shows how this living organism of capitalism had in some, in some respects parasitized itself upon the festivity in order to generate its own life-giving forces. Having said that, uh, it's not surprising that people love Christmas because at the end of the day, what we do have is again that antidote to the dullness of the year and also a, ten a, a, a sense of wonder that goes with it. It's funny, isn't it, that the sense of wonder comes out of the Christmas story, even though the Christmas story is probably in the end of the day not the really relevant factor here. We think of Christmas as being about the birth of Jesus Christ, but there's no evidence that he was born in December. In fact, there's no evidence that, that, that you know he was born on December the 20, 25th either. The whole business of, of that was established by the church on a purely no evidence basis at all. And uh, that random event was walloped on top of what had already been, as I was telling you earlier on, a pagan festival. So it's not really the Christmas story itself which is the issue. What was the issue at the end of the day was the sense of a reevaluation of social and, and cultural interaction which comes as part of that time of the year's sense of having time to contemplate because the activities of the rest of the of the daylight hours are shorter and then the, the nighttime hours where people had more time on their hands becomes more and more in evidence. So Christmas Carol fits really deeply into that and the time 1843 also is, 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 a, is a time for that too. This is the time leading up to the 1848 time of unrest throughout Europe and a sense of social change which was taking place everywhere. When, Ch when Charles Dickens was writing this, he was writing it at a time when socialism and Marxism were taking off throughout Europe. There was the beginnings of what you might call social revolution that was to haunt Europe and then later the rest of the world for the next century and a half. So, you know, it, it's not surprising that Christmas Carol was written around that time. I think Dickens wanted to get in on the act to a certain extent because Christmas Carol is a deeply socially 
critical work. It deals with a symbol, the symbol being Ebenezer Scrooge, the miser. But he's not just a miser. There, there can be all kinds of misers. There can be misers that have inherited their wealth and just sit on it like a dragon in Tolkien's The Hobbit. Well, this Ebenezer Scrooge is not that kind of miser. Ebenezer Scrooge ran a, bus ran a business. Ran a business with Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley is now dead. And uh, <laughs> I can hear Jacob Marley saying, No, I'm not. <laughs> Jacob Marley is now dead. And the time we get to Ebenezer Scrooge in the story, we are introduced to this person who was a businessman. And in some respects, this is the wonderfully ironic thing, a respectable businessman, but a horrifying one. He, Scrooge has within him, and in his name, Scrooge, the epitome of the worst of capitalism. He is an unremittingly hard man. He wants to get the 99.999% degree of work out of his uh, employees, in particular the, 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 the famous Bob Cratchit. He doesn't want to expand anything on the social graces. And what's worse, not only does he not want to do that for himself, sorry, for others, he also doesn't want to do it for himself either. He treats the world as if it was a hostile and horrifying place, and he hardens his heart to it. So when you meet him in Christmas Carol, he is already a far gone unremittingly depressing man and someone who has retreated away from the, the emotional vitality of the world and created this huge hard shell of fear of, and social suspicion around himself verging on violence the only reason that, that, that Ebenezer Scrooge doesn't use a whip is because he's too respectable for that he could get away with it, he would. He would do that not only for his employer employees, but he'd actually do it for himself too, to smash out of himself the sense of humanity that he sees as the most weak aspects of human beings. Human beings, for him, need to be hard, tough, individualistic, on their own, supporting themselves, and not asking for help, not asking for charity, not asking for anything from anybody. And if anybody does that, then they're seen as the scum of the earth. For him, the whole world should be like his own way of seeing the world, which is unremittingly harsh and cruel. He doesn't see the despair and, and, and pain of other people as being worth anything like compassion, because for, for Scrooge, compassion is the most weak thing possible. Hence, the protagonist that Dickens sets up is a critique of capitalism around him at the time, part and parcel of the period of advancing capital exploitation and capital expansion right throughout the Victorian period, at the time when Friedrich Engels was spending his time writing about the conditions of the poor, industrial poor in England, and leading to the um, synthesis of Marxist thought that well, as a, as to use an appropriate word would would haunt Europe evermore and still is with us. Now whether you agree with any of that, what's really important is to understand that, 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 that when when Dickens wrote this book, he also wrote it in such a way that it would be appealing to his largely Christian or at least pseudo Christian readership. I say pseudo Christian because British, I don't know if the, well, probably the British are still exactly the same now. The vast majority of, of British people, when asked which religion they are, most of them would probably say Church of England. Having said that, most of them have never sat, only ever set foot in a church uh, to go to the carol service or for a christening or for when they get married, and the rest of the time they're never there. So you could say that their Christianity is, is, as you might say, culturally deep, but not spiritually deep. Uh, and Dickens knew his readership. What he wanted to do is to not just preach at them about the iniquities of society. What he wanted to do was to do it in such a way as that it would appeal to sentiment, it would appeal to 
almost sentimentality as well, and would appeal to the idea of people getting involved with characters with whom they could identify from a virtuous point of view. So the characters are set up in almost caricature form as a means that people at the time could identify with. Scrooge is a horrible person. Tiny Tim is is the is the epitome of childish innocence and childish and childish hurt and pain and therefore suitable to be pitied. Bob Cratchit and his family are warm and together and loving to each other in the most perfect Victorian family, working class family style. Ebenezer Scrooge's rel rel relatives is, he, he, he are seen in the light of being middle class worthy people who play nice games and are kind to one another and, and wish each other a merry, merry Christmas and they probably give to the poor. In other words this appeal is not just a part of critique of society it also has within it a pseudo Christian approach and to add to that what I think is the genius of the story. There is the theme of redemption. Scrooge is the sinner that is redeemed. He is redeemed through his own capacity to be mutable, that he can change. That he, and the message that comes through the Celtic Christmas Sparrow story is every human being, no matter how bad they might be, can change. The irony, of course, is that in order to do that, Charles Dickens tells us a very scary ghost story and in order to change Ebenezer Scrooge he changes him by scaring the bejesus out of him. This <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge is this complacent, hard-hearted, fearful, horrible miser becomes a good man because he's terrified. He's terrified of the possibility of the future. He's shown in the visitations of the ghosts exactly what his future potentially will be and in order to avoid that fate you know thrust the thrusting of a person down into hell that terror that comes with that he is in a sense bludgeoned into goodness one can say that there is a certain satirical irony built into all of that in the sense that though this is a christian story it also exposes to clear view some of the ironies and and, uh, and comedy even of of, vir of a virtuous system which at the end of the day is all about scaring someone and in that sense the word it was appropriate I think for Charles Dickens to write a story that has this wonderful series of ghosts that appear after all what better way to scare your readership to scare Ebenezer Scrooge and to win the day than to use the forces of secular uh, supernatural systems in the sense of none of these ghosts are angels they're not demons they are in some respects the ghosts of time and space they are the ghosts of Christmas past the ghosts of Christmas present and the ghosts of Christmas yet to come past present and future combine to tell a story to Ebenezer Scrooge which at the end of the day frightens him half to death and gets him to wake up on Christmas morning with a revised heart. Many of us are probably sitting here right now and thinking to ourselves, goodness gracious, I wish the ghosts would visit one or two politicians I can think of and terrify them back into being virtuous. One could argue though, I suppose, that uh, uh, the, 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 this, this almost satirical view of, of, of the message of Christmas is uh, not exactly what I might call the best ethical approach to the idea of goodness that a person should be able to work out from their own experience exactly what doing the right thing morality should be without being terrorized by someone else nevertheless the, the book itself brings together cultural traditions from paganism from Christianity from also from the good old ghost story tradition which was part and parcel of the of the, a, a, the early 19th century idea of romance which i'll say a little bit about in a second and combines it into this moral tale of of of, of the season 
Out of Christmas Carol comes a number of traditions which we now take for granted. The idea of saying Merry Christmas to one another, for instance. The idea of people going around saying humbug <laughs> is part and parcel of that too, you know. It, the use of the word bar humbug in some respects gives you an opportunity to uh, humorously, uh, at the very least, take, it, take people to task about Christmas. The idea of turkeys on Christmas is another thing, you know. Excuse me. The idea, the idea of 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 ghostly visitations, which still still is with us. I mean, you know, the, one of the things that's interesting about the media at this time of year, at least in the UK, is there are there are always ghost stories for Christmas. All came out of a Christmas Carol, and that's why the story became a firm favourite with Victorians and later generations it never really has ever gone out of print it is still read it is being dramatized and re-dramatized and filmed and refilmed and adapted from everything from plays to musicals to monologues to you know what it's it's one of the most adapted stories that the media has ever taken on board it has still got a worthy side to it I want to emphasise in my serialisation the ghost story aspect. I want to emphasise the fearful aspect of it. I want to emphasise the idea that this, is, this story is supposed to be scary. The story is supposed to give you the chills. The story is supposed to be set in cold, dark, dank streets and rooms and graveyards and times of the year when a chill will naturally run up and down one's spine. It also is worthwhile, I suppose, mentioning in all of this that the business of, of the Christmas Carol very much fits in with the ideas of, of redemption that has been handed, almost colonised by Christmas stories ever since, but also has given us a sense of our own responsibilities at this time of the year, I think. And it, ironically, I suppose, and this is a big, deep irony, even more so than the Christmas story of of, of the Bible does you know what do you learn from the Christmas story of a Bible that it's a good idea not to let babies be born in, in stables and that you know kings from far far afield may come over to offer you presents along with shepherds and so on but the idea of the rest of the, of the story ideas from the rest of the story and this is truly ironic come out of the very many traditions of the 19th century part of which came out of novels such as that of, of Charles Dickens Okay, I, I suppose in some respects that brings me to the end of this video. I don't want to harp on and keep on going far too long. Um, I'll probably have missed something out in the process of talking about it. Uh, if so, you can always uh, message me and say, you didn't mention this bee. Okay, right, that, that's fine. Um, but I hope you found this interesting. When you see me again in the next of these series, I'll start the story off. And uh, I hope you will be with me each week um, as the story unfolds. Thank you so much for listening to all of this. Please do have a good week wherever you happen to be. Stay safe during this time of the pandemic. If you're watching this after the pandemic is over, lucky you. And uh, I hope that your Christmas, the run-up to your, to your Christmas is a peaceful and good one. Thank you. Bye-bye for now.